Hey guys, just want to thank you for tuning in today to our podcast and listening. We pray over these sermons that we put on here and we just believe that they will bring strength and life and encouragement to your daily walk and that they will build you up in your faith and push you towards Christ. And we pray that today is a day as you listen that all those things are accomplished. We're going to be in the book of Ruth, and that, that is the eighth book in, in the Old Testament. It's the eighth book in. Uh, there's Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, and then 1 Samuel. So it's, it's there, and it's short, and 84 verses, I think, and uh, so we're, we're, going, we're going to be there. First, I want to land in Romans 8, 28, but, but then we're going to go from there and, and read several passages as we go, kind of tell the story of, of Ruth. And today we're going to be talking about staying sweet through the hard times. Uh, we all have hard times. I mean, life is, life is tough, you know. We have challenges and difficulties and, and loss and, and grief. And, you know, we all, we all experience those things. We don't like any of them, but we all, we all experience them. I'm not afraid of bugs, of insects. My wife has this, some kind of strange fear of spiders, but I don't, and you know, and I'm not afraid of bugs. But when one gets in my shirt, I, I get, it gets a little freaky for me. And we were standing around with family, and I felt a, a bug, something crawling in my shirt. And then less than one second, I have my shirt off. And nobody knows what's going on, and they're standing there behind me, standing there looking at me, and I don't have a shirt on. I've got my shirt, and I'm shaking my shirt like, you know, and they're, they're like, what? And when trouble comes in my life, that's what I want to do with it. <laughs> you know, I want to take it off. Get it, you know, get that away from me. Get that out from my life. And I think all of us are that way. You know, we don't want trouble. We want things to be easy and smooth, you know, and happy and every, everything good. Uh, but life's not life's just not like that. And that's fortunate, really. Staying sweet through the tough times. How do you, how do you, when you go through a hard time, how do you stay sweet and not become bitter? How do you do that? Romans 8, 28. Uh, we're so familiar with this verse, uh, a lot of us. And we know, and we know, and we know that for those who love God, all things, all things work together for good to those who are called according to his purpose. And then he goes on and tells us what his purpose is, and that's that we become like Jesus Christ. And we know, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. All things work together for good. All things work together for good for those who love God. I mean, that's that's us. All things work together for good. And so what God does is he, is he takes our happy times and he takes our hard times and I guess he sort of makes a soup out of it, you know, and it turns out good. He kind of makes a soup out of it and then it, turns, it takes our hard times, our, our happy times, and he puts those together and we know that it turns out good, that God works it together for good. Um, and it's not like you're cooking. When you mix stuff together, it may not, it may be good and it might not, you know. But when the Lord puts together this soup that we call our Christian life, it always turns out good. It always works together for good. Oh, we know that, it says. We know that. There's no doubt about that. So when we go through difficulties, when God is mixing this stuff together in our lives that, that's going to come out for good, I can't see that, but it's going to come out for good, you know, we have a choice there to become bitter or to remain sweet, you know, and that's, that's, our, that's our choice. I want you to go to, to Ruth now. I just want to kind of tell the story. Ruth chapter 1 and verse 1. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. 
And a man of Bethlehem in Judea went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. So there was a famine in, in, in Judah, in, in Bethlehem, where uh, this man lived and his, his wife and his sons, and there was no food. He was a farmer, and there was, it was dry there, apparently, and, and there's no food. And so he goes to Moab, 50 or 60 miles to the east. He goes, and we don't know how far into Moab he went, but found fertile and, you know, good soil and, and is able to, he's just going to stay there for a while, you know, sojourn, it says, there. He's just going to be there for a while until things get better in Bethlehem, and then he's going to go, going to go back there. But this is what happens in verse 2. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the name of his two sons were Milan and Kilion. They, they were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judea, in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, verse 3, the husband of Naomi, died. So she goes down there with her, you know, her husband and her two sons, and her husband dies. And she was left with her two sons. And these two sons of hers took Moabite wives. The name of one of them was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. And, and they lived there about 10 years. And then both Milan and Kilion died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Wow. I mean, in the span of less than 10 years, she has lost her husband and her two sons. This has left her a widow. That was not a good thing to be in their time. Not a good thing to be. And so she was in a... She was in, straight. She was in a hard time. But she found out that back in Judah, back in Bethlehem, it had rained. God had blessed and there was food there. So she decided to go back home. So she told her uh, daughter-in-laws or daughters-in-law or one of those two, she told them and she told them that we're, we're going, I'm going back. And, and may God bless you girls. You girls go meet a good guy and have kids and just have a great life. Go, but you stay in Moab. I'm going back. And both of those uh, daughter-in-laws, daughters-in-law, anyway, both of those decided, no, uh, Naomi, we're going with you. We're going with you. We're, we're not, we're going with you. And they all wept and they said, we're, we're going with you. And, and Naomi said, no, you can't go with me. And this is what she says down in uh, verse 13. She says, no, my daughters, for it's exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. She felt like the hand of God was against her and that he had taken out her husband and her two sons. In fact, she's indicating here that if you... If it wasn't for me, you girls wouldn't be widows. This is my fault. God has done this evil. His hand is, is, is on me for evil. God's hand is against me. And you guys just got caught up in it, and I'm so sorry for that. Go back to your people. Go back to your families. Find a good man and live happily ever after. And they said, no, we're going with you. And she said, no, no, you can't go with me. I don't have anything for you. I don't have anything to offer you. I mean, I, there's, I've got nothing to offer you. And so Orpah went back to her people. But Ruth says, no, I'm going with you. I'm not going back. I'm going with you. And then she uttered one of the most uh, beautiful love commitments in all of literature. In verse 16, Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people should be my people, and your God, my God. And, and where you die, I will die. And there will I be buried. She says, Ruth, uh, Naomi, I'm with you. I'm with you till death do us part. I'm with you, and I'm staying with you. And if we die along our journey, then they'll just bury me right beside you right there. I'm staying with you. I'm with you in this. And so they went to... Bethlehem. So later they're, they're coming into Bethlehem. They went on their journey. And in verse 19, so the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. I mean, this was a well-known family, Elimelech and, 
and Naomi and, and the boys. And this is a well-known family, still had family there, a well-known family. And so they recognize her. I mean, she's, she's coming up. And, and the last part of uh, verse 19, and the women said, is this Naomi? She said, Naomi, is that you? I mean, she'd been gone 10 years, right? But she'd lost her husband and her two sons. And that's hard on you, you know? And when those women looked at her and said, Naomi, is that you? That was probably not a compliment. You know, probably not a compliment. Because things, had, you know, it had been hard. She had aged. And, you know, and they saw that. And so she said, Naomi, is this you? And this is what she said. She said, do not call me Naomi. Naomi means pleasant. The word Naomi means uh, pleasant. It means sweet. Do not call me Naomi, but call me Mara. The word Mara means bitter. Don't call me sweet. Don't call me pleasant. Call me bitter. Call me bitter. Folks, a lot of times when we go through hard times, you know, we come out the other end of it, or even when we're going through it, and somebody can just look at us and know, hey, that's bitter. You're bitter. How do you stay sweet? I mean, how do we do that? How do we, how do, we do that through the process? She so says, why do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me pleasant? Why call me sweet? When the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me. Number one, thankfulness happens, thankfulness occurs when we recognize God's plan even when we can't see it. Thankfulness comes. We get thankful to God. We can give thanksgiving to God when we recognize, when we're going through those hard times, we recognize that God has a plan. We don't have to see what the plan is. We don't have to be able to see the details of the plan just to know that He's got a plan to know that he's got one. Then we can begin to give thanksgiving to him and can begin to praise him because we know it's in. And so we go to the Lord and, and we say, Lord, I, I, I don't know what in the world you're doing. I, I don't know what you're doing, but I know that you're doing something. I know that you're doing something and, and I just want to thank you because I see all this good that you've done in my life and good, but I, I just, I don't see it now. Thankfulness occurs when we recognize God's plan even when we can't see it. All she could see was the hand of the Lord against her. All she could see was the hand of the Lord against her. And a lot of people get like that. You know, a lot of us get like that when we're going through hard times. We say, well, God is against me. I mean, some people say, well, there, there must not be a God because I'm, I've got these, this difficulty, I've got this hardship in my life. Other people say, well, God's hand is against me and get, get mad at God because God, your, your hand is strong against me. And we become bitter not sweet. Well, uh, uh, another thought. Difficulty can blind us to the blessings of God. She, she says in verse 21, she says, I went away full and the Lord has brought me back empty. Do you see that? I went away full and the Lord has brought me back empty. Empty. When it's when we're going through difficulty, when we're going through grief and loss and sorrow, we get blind to the blessings of God. Who gave her those, that fullness that she left with? You know, she left, when she left, she said, when I left Bethlehem, I had everything. I had everything. My husband and my kids, and we had plenty, and we, had, you know, we went and found a place that, that was fertile, and, and we had plenty, and, and, you know, but now the Lord has brought me. She couldn't see any of the blessings because we get blind you know, to, to that. Folks, we can't appreciate what God has given us if we can't see it. And we can't see it if we just concentrate on that God's hand is against us. If we just concentrate on, on the negative things. She concentrated on her losses. She counted her losses. She didn't count her blessings. Wow. I do that count my losses, forget about my blessings. You know, and that's what she was doing. Uh, I can count her. You want me to count her blessings? Let's just count her blessings. I know it's been 3,000 years, you know, since this happened, and we're looking back on it, but I, I can tell you, I can count her blessings. 
you know? First thing is, she went away full. God gave her that. Who gave her that stuff she went away full with? That was God. She had a husband. I know he died, but she had a husband. How many women would just like to, like to have a husband? Someone who loved her and took care of her. She had sons. I mean, how many women would just like to have children, right? And she had a place to go back to. I mean, the Lord had blessed Bethlehem. She had a place to go back to. That's a blessing. When she got back to Bethlehem, she had property. Had a house there, probably. She had a place to go, you know, when she got back there. When she got back there, she had family there. She had friends there, and they come out, and they, I mean, they are coming out and greeting her, saying, I, what, is this Naomi? Pleasant sweetness, it's good to have you back. I mean, those, those are blessings, you know, but she couldn't see any of those. And then there, there, were, there were her uh, daughter-in-laws, her daughters-in-law, I figured that out earlier, but I, I have forgotten it. Toby will tell me after the service which one I was supposed to be saying. There were her daughter-in-laws, and they loved her like a mother. I mean, when she said, I'm going back, th- th- I mean, they're weeping out loud. You see, they're, they're weeping out loud. I mean, they, they just can't, they're weeping. They loved her so much. Do you know how many mother-in-law jokes there are out there? You know how many there are. Now, don't look them up. Don't. If a hundred of you, when I leave here, if a hundred of you tell me a mother-in-law joke, I know that you are looking them up during my sermon. I mean, but there are so many. But they loved their mother-in-law. I mean, they loved her, didn't they? Another thing that difficulty does is it turns our focus inward. It can turn our focus inward. We can just see ourselves. Folks, when we're going through trouble, when we're going through a hard time, we don't need, our focus does not need to be me. My focus does not need to be me. But it's easy for that to happen. My focus needs to be not inward. My focus needs to be upward because our help comes from the Lord. That's where our salvation is going to come from. That's where our deliverance is going to come from. It's from the Lord. We need to be focused upward and we need to be focused outward too. God sends people to minister to us during our, if we cut everybody off and everything becomes about us, then it's woe is me and we feel sorry for ourselves and the whole world begins to revolve around me. Everything becomes about me. <clears throat> and when everything becomes about me and the world revolves around me, when I don't get my way, I get mad. I get angry. And while anger is a, is a healthy uh, step in the process of grief, if anger stays, it's not healthy and it becomes bitterness. Not sweetness, but Bitterness. No, we don't need to be focused inward. We need to be focused upward. But it's easy. I mean, you know, we're giving her a hard time, and, and I, you know, because of, of her attitude, and, and you know, so now we're, we're giving her a hard time about that. But, folks, she had had a hard time. Do you understand that? She, this woman had had a hard time. I mean, this was, this was difficult. She'd not had a, an easy time. Number two, God is so good that whatever he gives us is good too. God is so good that whatever he gives us is good too. Whatever it is. Aren't you glad of that? God is so good that whatever he gives us is good too. And you know, that's a really good thing because life can be really hard sometimes. And it's a good thing that God is good. And I think that sometimes I think, oh, it's a good thing that God is good because this life can be so tough. It can be so tough. Whatever God gives us, it's, it's, it's good because God is so good. Well, we, we, need, we need to continue with the story. So they were, in, they were in Bethlehem. They'd moved in, and so they're there in Bethlehem. And so what they had to do, they were poor, didn't have anything. They had property, but they couldn't use it. I mean, you know, couldn't sell it unless they found somebody kin to the family. And according to the, according to the law... And so they were there, and, and Ruth said, Naomi, you stay here. I'm going to go out in the fields, and I'm going to uh, green, gl- glean grain. I'm going, to gather, I'm going to gather grain. That's not easy to say when you're sitting here, and your mouth's dry. And the pastor has on Florida shirt. <clears throat> but no, I'm over that. I I'm, I'm really am over that. 
And so she goes out and she, she's going to go to the field. And, and what the law says is that they've got to leave some behind. The farmer's got to leave some behind, to leave some of the crop behind. And so they're going through, they're not to gather everything so that the poor can come. And so, so that's what Naomi did. And this is what it says in verse 3, chapter 2 of verse 3. So she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come. And she happened to come to the part of the field that belonged to Boaz of the clan of Elimelech. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz. And she goes and she says, uh, can, I, can, I gl- <laughs> can I glean, that, that's it, can I glean the, yes, glean the grain, I'm sorry, Thank you. You're a nice guy. Still. <laughs> and they said, yes, yes, you can. And so she goes out and she begins to gather the grain. Now, it just happened to be that she lit upon that field. How about that? How lucky was that? Well, she had a lucky day, didn't she? Say, this is no, say, no, it wasn't lucky. Well, what a coincidence that she goes in that field where Boaz is. Now, now Boaz is going to end up being her husband. He's going to end up buying that property and taking them in and marrying her, and, and everything's going to be good because of Boaz. And she just happened to go to his field. She had no idea who he was. So she's there, and she's gleaning, and, and Boaz comes out from Bethlehem, and he's, he's wealthy, apparently, and, and so he's got all of his workers, and he calls his foreman over, and he sees Ruth out there gleaning in the field, and he says, who is that? I mean, one look, and he's like, who is that? And his, his foreman said, oh, that's, that's Ruth, you know, she's Naomi's uh, daughter-in-law, and boy, she's taking care of Naomi, and she's been here all day long, and she's just taking one little short break. I mean, that woman is a worker. She is something else, and Boaz said, I can see that clearly. And so he invited her, that day he invited her to lunch with them, you know, to eat with all the workers, and it just happened to be there was a seat right beside Boaz. Ruth, just sit right here, you know, and then after they had lunch, she had some left over, and she packed it to take it home to Naomi. And, and uh, he, he told uh, the workers after lunch, he, he told them, he said, you know, if, uh, if, if Ruth is uh, gleaning behind you, just, uh, could you just, just drop some out of your bundle so that she can pick it up. Would you, you guys do that? I mean, this guy is stuck on this girl, right? You know, just, just do that. So the end of the day comes. And Naomi go, uh, Naomi's at home, and, and Ruth goes home to her. And in verse 20, And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, May he be blessed. And she says, Well, where did you get all this grain? I mean, she has this grain. She has food. Where did you get all of this? And she said, It's, it's from Boaz. I met Boaz today. And she said in verse 20, May he be blessed by the Lord who's, listen, whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Whoa, Naomi has come around. Naomi realizes that the kindness, the hesed, the loving kindness of God, we don't have a good English word for that, but the loving kindness of God has not forsaken me. She's beginning to see that God is so good that whatever he gives us is good too. Before, she just saw the hand of God against her, and now she's seeing that the hand of God is for her. Do you see this turnaround? Folks, we've got to, when we're going through grief and difficulty, we've got to reach this point of getting enough through that grief so that we can begin to thank the Lord and begin to realize, Lord, your kindness has not forsaken me. God, you are still with me. You're still in my life. You're still helping me. There was no doubt in Naomi's mind that God was involved in their lives the whole time. Now, she was blaming him. She was mad at God. But now she's coming to this point where she realizes that he was there. Naomi realized something that was very important. All along she realized that something very important. And, and get, when did something we need to realize? God either caused it or he allowed it to happen. I'm talking about the death of her husband and her sons. God either caused it or he allowed it to happen. And so, you know, some use this as a proof that God doesn't exist. Because if God was loving, then he wouldn't allow evil to happen, bad things to happen to good people. I mean, some people use use that, you know. 
And some people say, well, God, you know, God is loving. God does love us, and, and, you know, but he, he doesn't know what's going on in our lives. Folks, that's not our God. That's not the God of the Bible. And some people say, well, yeah, God, is, God you know, loves us, and, and God knows what's going on in our lives. He's just not powerful enough to do anything about it. Folks, that is not the God of the Bible. God, God does love us. He does know us, and he is able to do something about our situation. Folks, we don't have to understand it. We don't have to understand what God is doing because we have faith. We don't have to see God's plan clearly yet because we have faith. We believe in Him. We believe that what He's doing is good. We know that all things are going to work together for good. We know that. We don't have to understand everything. Job said, you know, Job in the Bible, he had all that trouble, lost everything. He lost his kids, his farm, his health, he lost everything. And he says, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. And we don't understand this, why, you know, God does what he does, but we just need to, and I don't have time to expound on that, and, you know, but we just, God is so good that whatever he gives us, it is good too. We don't have to understand it. We have faith. You know, Jesus told his disciples, you know, the kids were all gathered around him, and, and his disciples said, get, kids, get the kids away from here. Jesus is busy. And Jesus said, don't get those kids away from me. I love these kids. Bring these kids on. He said, in fact, unless you become like one of these kids, you're not going to heaven. Well, what do you mean like one of these kids? Uh, those kids didn't have everything figured out. Do you understand that? Those kids did not have everything figured out. We think we've got to get everything figured out. When we're going through difficulty, we think we've got to figure it all out. Well, I've got to figure it out. When I make sense of it, then I'll get back with the Lord. No, you don't have to figure it out. God's got to figure it out. God's got to figure it out, and He does love you. And He does know what's going on in your life and cares about that. And He is powerful enough to do anything about it. Now, anything that evil happens, anything evil that happens, God didn't do that because He is holy, right? He's holy, and that would go against His character. But God allows things to happen in our lives that we don't like. I teach a vacation Bible school. Uh, I teach fifth grade. And in our fifth grade, well, they're going into sixth grade, I guess. You, even in Florida, you know, fifth grade is going into sixth grade. Uh, but but they're, going, they're also going into our youth department. And so what we do during that week of, of Bible school is uh, we kind of get them prepared to go into the youth group where there's going to be, you know, praise and, and preaching and, and so forth, you know, in the, in the youth group. And so that's what I do as I preach or teach them, you know, 20 or 30 minutes. And it's amazing. I just sit there and watch, listen. I mean, like, it's, it's just amazing. I taught the third and fourth grade for a couple of years and boy, I had to stand on my head to get them to listen and turn flips and dance and sing. And I'm not good at any of those things. So they moved me to the fifth grade. I said, maybe these kids are listening. And they do. It's, it's, it's just amazing. And so, we, you know, the praise band is up there singing, you know, and leading these fifth graders in praise. And, and I'm standing back and back. And, and one day, the lesson was from John chapter 9, and where the man was born blind. And the disciples said, who sinned, this man or his parents? And Jesus said, neither one of them sinned. This sickness was not caused by sin. It was, you know, he was born blind so that God could be glorified through his body so that the honor could come to the Lord, so that the works of God would be manifest, would be shown, demonstrated in his life. That's why this man was born blind. They just couldn't quite get that. And so that's what the lesson was on. And so I, I thought, you know, that begs the question, that, that asks the question to me, why do bad things happen to good people? Why do bad things happen to us? And I thought, well, I'm, I'm going to, you know, so I prepared the lesson around that. But it's also a lesson about God, about Jesus healing, you know. And so all the kids were sitting there, and we're praising, we had a good morning, everybody's happy, and everything's going good, and, and uh, I'm thinking, I'm not going to get up there and be the downer, I'm not going to get up there and ask those questions, those, that, those kids that question, why do bad things happen, the good people, I'm, I'm not going to pose that question, I'm not going to be Ira the downer today, I'm not, gonna, I'm not doing that, you know, I'm going to just, I'm going to talk about Jesus heals, and that's the truth, and that's wonderful. So I was standing back there looking at the back of their heads, and it came my time, and the praise was finished. And, and I, I walked up front, and I sat on the stage. That's what I do. And I sat down on the stage, and the kids were sitting, about 40 of them were sitting, you know, kind of in a semicircle in front of me on the floor. 
And I looked at those kids, and as I looked at those 40 kids, I saw two kids that I know have been abused. And no telling how many others. But those two that I happen to know about. And I thought, these kids know about the bad things that happen to people. These kids know more about it than I do. And so I decided, well, I, you know, Lord, I, I got to go on with this. And so I, I posed the question, why do bad things happen to us? And I used our grandson Gideon as an example. Our grandson Gideon is now 19 years old. In fact, he's in the hospital right now. But he's 19 years old and he's paralyzed uh, completely. He has a, a genetic disorder and, and uh, through these years he's become paralyzed and and uh, he can't move anything. He can move his head a little bit, just a little bit. And he co- communicates with his eyes. He can move his eyes up and down or, yes, or back and forth to say yes or no. His mind is perfect, but his body has just quit on him. You know? And uh, he's, he's, he can smile. <laughs> he can smile. And I told those kids about him, and I said, you know, he, to me, he should be driving. He should have a car. He should have a girlfriend. He should have a job. I mean, you know, that's what... Kids do, you know, get teenagers and get out of high school. And I mean, that's what these kids, that's what happens. You know, but not my grandson. He's in bed. Just trying to breathe. And I told him, I said, I don't know why it happens. You know, God could have healed him. It was genetic, but God could have changed his genetics. That's no problem for God. You know, God could have healed him, but for whatever reason, God has chosen not to do that. And, and that's okay most of the time with me. That's okay. You know, God has something better. You know, God just has something better. And so I was, I was telling them that. And, and one of the workers back in the back, she said, Ira, can I say something? I said, yeah. You know, and again, I, I don't know what's, I don't know, I don't understand all about what's going on with our grandson Gideon. I mean, I don't understand all that and why, but I know that God's good. That's what we've learned from Gideon. We have learned that God is good. I mean, if, if nothing else, we've learned that God surely is so good that whatever he gives us is good. We don't have to understand. So the lady stand up sitting back in the back. She said, can I say something? Sure. Not planned. She said, I, I lived in New Orleans and Katrina came, hurricane. And I, water got up in our second floor of our house. The time we got back in there, everything was molded. We lost everything. Didn't have flood insurance. Lost everything. House falling down. Lost everything. She said, we had kids. We can't start over. She said, it was the worst day of our lives, the worst time of our lives. We struggled. She said, but you know, we learned through that that God is good. You know, God really is good. And she said, I don't understand all that, but because of that, we moved to St. Augustine, and we both got better jobs. My husband and I both got better jobs, and the kids ended up in a lot better schools. And I don't understand all that, but I know that God's good. Another worker in the back, uh, that had to happen eventually. Uh, another worker back in the back said, can I say something? Yeah. She said, but when we got married, we had plans. You know, we we're going to have kids, and we're going to, you know, we have this, all these plans. And, and uh, she said, but we couldn't have kids. We tried and tried and spent a lot of money. And we couldn't have kids. And as a result of that, we adopted a five-year-old boy. And that, that young man, he's a fifth grader, and he was sitting right there in front of me on the floor. And she said, if God, you know, I don't understand all that, but, but if God had allowed me to have kids, if I'd had kids, I never would have met him. And I never would have been able to be part of his life. Never would have been able to. And I don't understand, but I know that God is good. One of the youth workers that plays in the praise band got up from the back, and I mean, this was, I didn't know that this was going to happen. She got up from the back and came and sat down on the stage right beside me. And she said, I was abused. And they took me away from my parents. And they put me in foster care. But when I was 13 years old, I was adopted by a family in St. Augustine. And they brought me to Anastasia Church. And I got saved. And now I'm 16 years old and I'm leading the praise band. And she told those kids... She told this kid, she said, no matter what happens to you, you better know that God is good and that God's going to take care of you and that God's going to be there for you and that you're going to get through it and things are going to get better. She said, you need to learn that. And 
And see, nothing is wasted. I closed in prayer that day. Five kids got saved. Nothing is wasted. God takes the, the, our happy times and our sad times and, you know, he, he mixes all those, the hard times and the happy times together and it always turns out good. It all, we know that it always turns out good. It, not that it might turn out good. It always turns out good. Uh, we need to finish the story. Ruth chapter 4 and verse 13. They get married, Ruth and, and Boaz get married. So Boaz took Ruth this is uh, Ruth 4 and, and 13. So Boaz took Ruth and, and became her, his wife. Uh, and he went into her and the Lord gave her conception and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer. And may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be a restorer to you. She shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher in your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons would have been, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. Wow. Wow. Folks, we may not get over whatever we're going through, but we will get through it. Did Naomi still miss her husband and her sons? I'm sure she did. But she was able to go on, and God had something really good for her. The best was yet to come. She could not possibly have known what was going to happen. You see, her grandson that was sitting on her lap, you know, Naomi had said, you know, the Lord brought me back empty. And so I say now to Naomi, oh, Naomi, you're empty? Looks like there's a grandbaby on your lap to me. And that grandbaby was named Obed. And Obed grew up and he had a son named Jesse. And Jesse grew up and he had a son named David, King David. And then from David came an offspring that we call the King of Kings, that is King Jesus. Naomi could have had, I mean, she's, there's no way that she could have had any idea what God was doing during this whole process. And we look in the New Testament and we see this family mentioned. And God just took these bad things and, and God just, I mean, he sends the mess messianic line through Naomi and Ruth, this Moabite woman. Wow. Life is, life is good, but the best is yet to come. Toby saw that on a sign this morning. Life is good, but the, but the best is yet to come. Folks, no matter what you're going through, no matter what's happening right now in your life, I'm telling you, the best is yet to come. Folks, we've got to focus upward. We've got to. We've, we've got to keep our eyes on Jesus. We've got to do that. We're going to go through tough times. I mean, we can always say something is wrong in my life. Something, you know, something's not. When we start counting our blessings, oh, then it gets good. Naomi didn't know. She didn't know, but she ended up with that grandbaby sitting on her lap. Hallelujah. And that grandbaby led to another one, another one, and, and then David's son, the Savior of the world. Wow. God is so good that whatever he gives us is good too. You need to be convinced of that. You need to know that. If something's going on in your life and you're not sure, settle that today. Settle it today. Let's stand. Thanks again for listening to this sermon. And if you'd like to keep up with us, you could do so by going to our Facebook page or our Instagram, or feel free to go to our website at gracemeadows.cc or we would love for you to come and worship with us at 10 a.m. on Sunday mornings.